Hello listeners and welcome to this mini-series on infiltrating cults. I'm your speaker Casey and in part one, Lisa Van Arnsdale talked us through her life and interest in cults and high control groups. In part two, Lisa spoke of some specific stories of groups that she has visited and spent time inside of. And in this third and final part, Lisa has a few more stories up her sleeve about other groups that she has brushed shoulders with that are widely considered to be cults. For early access to ad-free full-length episodes, please go to patreon.com forward slash the cult vault to support the show or follow the links in the episode description. Now, here is Lisa. That's the big risk, isn't it? When people say on Reddit, for example, in the r slash cult subreddit, I'm thinking of infiltrating this cult so I can do a research paper or so I can do a school paper or mm-hmm. so I can answer my own questions, my own curiosities about the group. The, the the big risk is always that even if the group are aware of your intentions, your agenda, mm-hmm. your, your motives in going to spend time with them, there's always the risk that those tactics will wear you down and eventually will work in the group's favor in terms of getting you to agree to stay even if it's just for an extra day or an extra few days and then a couple of weeks totally and i would not have been surprised if they had told those hikers like oh it's our sabbath so we can't drive you back to the trail today so sorry you're gonna have to stay and hang out with us until tomorrow and then hopefully we'll have time or whatever Um, And then, you know, you better hope that they're not too busy the next day because, I mean, they're just doing you a favor and beggars can't be choosers. And they had said, like, online, it had said that the property was 10 minutes from the trail and it was more like 20. So um, they're certainly not above, like, minor sneakies to (laughs) to try to get you to linger. And kind of getting callbacks to the film Midsummer in that regard. Yeah. I know that Midsummer oh, is kind of a, an amalgamation of all things extreme cults. Yes. Kind of thrown together to create the most horrific depiction of, of what true cult like environments look like. But Absolutely. of course, in the earlier stages before things really went crazy in that mm-hmm. film, the simple things were oh, there's no one to take you right now. Yeah, and we're just so far from everything that, like, you can't leave on your own. Yeah, exactly. Just stay for the dinner tonight. It's going to be a a lovely communal dinner. You know, everybody's worked really hard to put this together for everybody to enjoy. And Yeah, that underlying tension of, like, you're snubbing them or inconveniencing them if you don't follow along. Exactly. Yeah. Wow, that's a really interesting story thank you for sharing that with us lisa but of course there's so many more things that that you have to to offer um and we don't i don't even think we're going to have enough time to get through everything today so and that's okay <laughs> i'm just going to reel off some things and i will sure. let you tell us as much about them as you want to and we'll just sure. see how far down the list we get if that works for totally. you totally totally so you yeah. are in pennsylvania it's been called Amish town um, by people that I know or or Amish country. Amish country, yeah. So it's being called Amish country by people that I have been to visit in New Jersey, which of course is okay. not too far from Pennsylvania. Yeah. And likewise, a, a few friends in Philadelphia as well. So talk us through your experiences spending time with the Amish community. Oh, man, Casey. So this was another earlier visit for me. Um, It had been on my list for a really long time. I wanted to have like the cross cultural experience of like living with an Amish family and like churning butter and milking a cow and all of that stuff. And that was an idea I had before it really occurred to me that they were like a culty group with skeletons in their closet and that there was like sinister stuff at work there. And I feel like that's um, a group that has pretty outstanding PR with the world at large. Um, I think there's some white supremacy at work there, certainly, because if we heard of a group of black or brown people that were living primitively off the land and all of these things, 
it might be received differently. So they've definitely got white supremacy working in their favor. But even here, a lot of people just think of the Amish as like a tourist attraction, like, oh, these charming people who don't use zippers and live a simple life. And, you know, they trade modern technology for the closeness of their support group or whatever. Um, they so I got to go spend a night with the Amish. It was an elderly couple. And I'm going to try to make this fast. Um, an elderly couple who the husband was retired and all but one of their kids were out of the house. And, um, you know, I got to do the whole like ride in a horse and buggy and eat delicious food and see their farm and go with them to get fresh milk and all of that stuff that you would hope for in visiting an Amish family. And they were pretty worldly for Amish people. There is like no universal set of rules for the Amish as a whole. Um, the rules that you live by are determined by the elders in your particular church. So like you could live in this house here and be allowed to have a cell phone, but your neighbors aren't because you attend different churches. Um, and so this older couple who were making good money and they, they were in the business of having visitors. Like they had a map with tax on all the places where they've had visitors from and they were from all over the world. So good for them. They, um, they had, they don't go on a plane unless it's an emergency. Um, but they had been on a cruise and every winter they would get a pass for Amtrak, which is like the nationwide railroad here. And, um, the husband really, really, really loved trains. And I had been living in New York at the time. And he had said to me, the following morning after like the best breakfast of my life of farm fresh, wonderful food. He said, I've been to New York plenty of times, but I don't know how the subway works. I would love to be able to go in the subway and also to see places that you can only get in the subway. Could I pay you to take me around New York? And I was like, hell yeah, I will absolutely lead a tiny old Amish man around the skyscrapers. <laughs> like, sign me up. Um, and long story short, he came to visit and I took him around New York and it was just such a sight to see, to see this tiny little Amish man crossing busy streets and everything. And we went and saw everything. Um, but guess what he talked about the entire time, Casey, can you guess? Something to do with his belief system. I'm going to just kind of guess. Oh, that would have been predictable and appropriate. No, he talked about masturbation the entire day. Oh, wow. I did not see that coming. Yes, neither did I. Um, so Wow, maybe he, he's just like, I'm going to throw caution to the wind. I'm going to see oh, modern buildings, modern skyscrapers. I'm going to go see how the technological world works. Right. I'm and going to be I, a loose I, cannon. And, 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 and I've been so suppressed in terms of sexuality that I'm just going to talk about masturbation as well. Yeah, it was like such a poignant encounter for me because growing up in purity culture, like you just pretended that sex was not a natural part of life, that it's like this thing to either ignore or be deeply ashamed about. So he certainly had my empathy in that regard. But what happened was like he turned it up slowly like there's that metaphor and the 12 tribes love this about like you can't just throw a frog into boiling water you got to turn the heat up slowly so they don't jump out that is what he did so he started with like a small comment like he had a a flip phone for travel um and he had called to be like I'm gonna meet you in Penn Station under the sign or whatever and I said, great, I'll see you there. And he said, I'm looking forward to having such a beautiful tour guide today. And I just kind of like rolled my eyes at that. Okay. But that was the first turning up the heat. And then, you know, I get him at Penn Station and we're walking to Times Square. And he says how the last time he was in New York, it was the spring and girls were wearing short skirts and one sat down on the floor and he could see everything and it made his day. And like that's turning up the heat a little more because like it's about like the difference in wardrobe, but like also a little pervy. Uh, <laughs> and so he just like turned it up slowly. 
And before you know it, he's telling me how he ran away to New York when he was young and watched porn back when Times Square was like a very triple X place. And about the um, the old man who masturbated in front of him when he was a kid and how it would turn him on to watch. But he turned it up slowly and you you get backed into this corner where if I if I say to him, like, this is inappropriate, stop. I now have to live with the tension of that for the rest of the day as we're touring him around. And it might not be worth it to live with the tension of that and whatever things he might say in response to that. Um, And also, if I say, if you don't stop, I'm going to leave you here. I'm now the bad guy because I left a 70 year old Amish man defenseless in the financial district or whatever, you know. Um, So he really backed me into a corner. (laughs) Um, And by the end of the day, like I've got him back at Penn Station. And at this point, he's talking about how he like ordered dick enlargement pills and they didn't work. And he had to work really hard to get his money back. And I am just like on mental autopilot at this point like truly washed over in shock um and how his wife's pussy is not as tight as it used to be and on that I kind of lost it and was like well she is like 70 years old and did have six children so I don't know what to tell you man like she did create six humans with her body cry me a river uh but so like he he eventually got on his train and I'm just like reeling from like what the fuckness after after this day and so I wrote it all down and I turned it into a blog entry um a two-parter the first part is where I go out there to visit and then the second part is where he talks about creepy shit all over Manhattan and no lie Year after year, it is my most read blog entry because it is what comes up if you Google do Amish people masturbate. So, That's someone, so interesting. Oh someone my goodness. Someone reads it almost every day. Uh, so I am like the supreme authority on Amish masturbation, apparently. <laughs> Things I never thought I'd say. But yeah, it was wild. It was fucking wild. And it left me with, a lot to think about because like while I was mad at him for being a creep and because like he'd clearly been methodical and turning up the heat slowly he also just like absolutely had my pity because he must be in a very desperate situation if he's resorting to talking about that stuff to me that means that there's no one in his community his wife his friends his family that he can talk to about this or he wouldn't be doing that you know so 70 years old as well is on the older side of the scale so you do wonder if perhaps people start to reflect on certain things as they get older knowing that you know we are mortal um understanding that a lot of belief systems may have things like reincarnation or Mm -hmm. heaven or 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 heaven or, or some type of Uh, salvation after death utopia after death not all belief systems have that a lot of belief systems believe that that will happen on earth during our lifetimes that we will live in that age where that happens to us as we are in our mortal bodies yeah I wonder if people start to reflect on repressed sexuality Sexual oh, yeah, oppression. A bit of an existential crisis there. And, and he had a son who had left the Amish faith and they were on good terms and everything because he hadn't ever taken the vow. So it's not like they had to shun him or anything. But he, the wheels were clearly turning in his head. And it was hilarious looking back, but also very tragic and very poignant. It was quite an experience for me. So that's the Amish. <laughs> I thought you were going to end on him propositioning you somehow, if I'm honest. I thought that that was kind of where things were going. Uh, He never blatantly did. He definitely was like, 
are there hotels in New York that have hot tubs? Like, like that sort of thing, but never like directly. And um, in his defense, he did come back to New York again, but he brought a group of people with him and he was appropriate that whole time. And I now have just the most wonderful pictures of like Amish people in, in the subway and in front of the Statue of Liberty and stuff. And it was very, very cool to like see people being shocked and interacting with them and everything. I remember at university, I had a friend from Singapore, his nickname was Iggy and it snowed one night and I have the most fondest memories of of this this big guy from Singapore standing in his shorts and flip flops in the snow with his mouth wide open, like catching snowflakes in his mouth, absolutely in awe of being yes. in the snow, which he'd never ever experienced in his life. So totally, I can kind of um, the I can contrast kind of, of the vision. Yeah, totally you know, incredible, incredible. I can just see it vividly in my mind. Absolutely. Um, Well, I mean, aside from the Amish man basically disclosing some type of sexual abuse that he endured as a child. Yes, yes. There are some other things that that you mentioned. You, in your video with Siren, you're wearing a Mooney crown. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So tell us this whole story. Was Was it the Unification Church or was it one of the more extremist, I can't believe I've just said that in one sentence, more extremist right. sects of the Unification Church, like Sean Moons, the son of some young moons, a AR-15 semi-automatic cult. Yes. So, yeah, they're the really juicy, interesting ones. They are, I really live in a great place for cults because they're only two hours north of me. Oh, Those, are you? I thought I thought yeah. you were in Pennsylvania, not Los Angeles. Oh, no, Sean Moon's an East Coast guy. <laughs> I just feel like all the cults I cover uh Yeah, you think there's Scientology <laughs> and like communes and things and uh, Manson and everything. But uh, yeah, so Sean's sect, I know that like they don't like to be called the Moonies anymore, that it's more of a pejorative term now. I call them the Moonies not to be insensitive, but because... To call Sean's sect the Unification Church wouldn't be accurate because while they are an offshoot of it, they I don't think that they would call themselves the Unification Church anymore. Um, And nobody knows what I mean when I say Sanctuary Church, which is the name of their church. So I call them Moonies for the sake of being as accurate in a description as possible. It's not to be mean. Um, But yeah, this particular sect of the movies is just off the rails. I went to visit them for my own joy long before there was talk of me having a show, long before Siren entered my world. Um, because I had seen, I mean, I had been aware of the Moonies for some time, but I had seen the episode of Cults and Extreme Beliefs about them and was like, wait, they're real close to me. I can go see them. And so I did. And they, uh, they, there's just so much to say about them. And if you go on Siren's website, cultstories.com, you can read my stuff about them. But as for the crown itself, like, what an arc of a story. So like, I watch this documentary. And I see that these people at Sanctuary Church all wear crowns. And like, I just know in my heart of hearts that I will not be happy until I have one. Like I need a Mooney crown and I can feel it in my heart that I need one and that I will not be satisfied until I get one. So I go and I visit this church and there's Pastor Sean and he's got his crown of bullets um, and his pocket knives and both sides and his wife is she's got a gun on her holster and everything. And there's a sign that says like protected by the rod of iron over the door of the church and everything. And I, there had been a wedding that day. Um, and the groom was wearing his assault rifle during the ceremony. And they took me to their shooting range and pastor Sean let me shoot his gun and said, I had great finger discipline and you know, I never knew it, but it turns out that like shooting a cult leader's assault rifle and being told you have 
great finger discipline is a a hell of an experience to have. Like, what a feeling. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, they wear these crowns, and it's because when you get married, you you whatever bullshit about you're a king and a queen, and then you start a family and you have your own kingdom, and we're all kings and queens and Jesus, yada yada yada. Um, so if you're married within the church, you can wear crowns. And my inner child just wants one of these gorgeous crowns so badly. And I'm asking different people in the congregation who, and they're all very friendly. I'm like, oh, your crown is gorgeous. Where did you get it? And they each say, oh, someone in our congregation makes them. I'm like, really? Could I get their information? No, you need to be married within the church. And there's going to be a wedding that day. So I'm talking to the the mother of the bride and she got crowns made for her and her husband like specially for the occasion and she had ordered them for the bride and groom I'm like oh these are so beautiful where can I no you have to be married with like I'm just being shot down <laughs> every time um and so like I went away with no information about where to get one and then my brother bless his heart used his male privilege and emailed the church. And I was like, say whatever you need to do. Like, I want one of these crowns. If you need to weave a story, feel free. Uh, but my brother emails them and is like, hey, my sister visited your church and she really enjoyed your visit. Where could she buy a crown? And they just told him. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That's really Hello, interesting. Hello. So they just send him the website and he's like, pick out your crown. <laughs> and um, I got a, a Mooney crown from Santa for Christmas that year. And everyone who told me that you have to be married to get one can suck a dick because I've got one anyway. And um, I even like got to, it didn't quite fit right. So I got to go visit the guy who makes them at his house and he like adjusted it for me and I got to see where he makes all of them and like eat fresh bread with him and his wife. So like everyone who told me no can suck a dick. I got my Mooney crown. I got it. Um, and actually the weekend before last, they were having their big, I can't believe this is real, Rod of Iron Freedom Festival, which is like Guns Palooza, essentially. It's the largest open carry festival in America and therefore the world. Um, and they're all just like, yay, America, yay, Jesus, yay, Second Amendment, yippee for guns. Um, and Pastor Sean was there and everybody was there. And I went to check it out, of course, because I'm like that. And my crown guy was there and he saw me and was so happy to see me. And we hugged. And he took me over to his booth and he told the ladies who were running his booth, this is Lisa. She's very special. She gets a discount. And, <laughs> and he had some crowns for sale there, but you only need one Moody crown, you know, everything in moderation. Um, but I, I purchased some earrings with some revolvers dangling from them. There's a lot of that there. A lot of gun jewelry. Um, they're really fetishizing the whole you're a patriot if you own a gun thing um but yeah I got my Mooney crown and no one can take it from me damn it nobody can take it from me and I like to wear it with my Mormon underwear Wow. Oh my goodness. That is, I would, I think you're going to have to start sending out kind of pictures of these things. I, I know that there is video footage of you wearing your Mooney crown. And I, I did worry at one point that you were going to say, well, if the only way to get one is to marry within the church, then uh, I'm, I'm now, a, I'm now a divorced woman. <laughs> I'm on the market. No. Um, but yeah, in that, in that bit of footage you saw the other day, Siren had asked me to wear that. I don't usually just drive around dressed like that. But I was also wearing my Mormon underwear as well as a rosary. He had told me to like dress it up. Um, but 
I plan to wear both in my one woman show. Um, and they'll probably like be on the poster for it when the time comes and everything. Oh my goodness. This is going to be such an interesting live show. And there's, there's things that we haven't even touched on. I mean, one thing I read about Sean Moon's set, Mm -hmm. when I spoke to Elgin Strait of the Fallen Out podcast at at Mm CrimeCon recently, when we did our, our live panel, he talked about how it's kind of like a Game of Thrones scenario where some young moon died and everybody thought that they had a claim to the throne of some young moon. So it's yes. his, it's his widower. It's his widow, widow. Mm-hmm. that now runs the Unification Church or whatever name it's going by at the moment. Unification because... Church still, yeah. And the both sons two sons have broken off and started their own thing but i think sean moons is obviously in the news more often because much more shocking the guns and they had a presence at the january 6th insurrection as well as far as i'm aware yes they did yes they did um what was interesting was at the rod of iron freedom festival there there, there was like a stage and they were giving talks and everything. And the guy who was like emceeing the opening ceremony openly admitted to having entered the Capitol on January 6th and spent 60 days in whatever prison and is being subpoenaed and everything. And there were people there wearing T-shirts like stating their support for the patriots who entered the Capitol. Um, and this is just funny. I. I was talking to him afterwards and I introduced myself and I was wearing a jacket that I got from my taste testing job and it says sensory panelist on it. And he said, sensory panelist, your beauty has me in sensory overload. And I didn't know whether to laugh or vomit. Um, So I can now say that someone who stormed the Capitol thinks I'm pretty lucky me. Uh, (laughs) But yeah, they were, they were there. Um, other Moonies I talked to said that they were there and they didn't enter the Capitol. They were there because they believe that Trump won. So they were showing up for a peaceful protest and they also wanted to be present if women and children needed help getting out. Um, but that guy openly admitted that he had been inside and I'm sure others had as well. I understand that there is probably some agenda there that serves Sean Moon in terms of, and I, I understand that I'm using his Americanized name. Um, yeah, we all, yeah. Hu- is it Hugin? I wouldn't know how to pronounce it, but that would be my guess. Something along those lines. Yeah. But he answers to Pastor Sean. That's what everybody calls him. Hyunjin Moon. Mm-hmm probably does have a lot to gain from aligning himself with the far-right extremist movement in America right now. But also it surprises me that he's willing to endorse somebody else as being some kind of lord and saviour of the American people. Right? He, um, Yeah, he absolutely stands to benefit from pushing the whole far-right agenda because his brother Justin owns a massive company that manufactures ammunition so it's a nice way of keeping the wealth in the family um, to have a congregation of people who think that guns equal godliness because they will spend money on guns and ammunition and going to events that they endorse um such as the Rod of Iron Freedom Festival, which was on the grounds of the Tommy Gun Warehouse, which is what his brother Justin owns. Um, the event was surprisingly, like, not super moony centric. It was definitely an event where you wouldn't feel out of place if you were just your typical evangelical far right Christian. Like, there were a few nods to like. We believe our dad was the second coming of Christ, but they were minor. Like they're definitely willing to like play their cards in such a way that they'll get more power, even if it means missing their own point at some point. I read something at some point about people wanting to pledge their allegiance to Sean Moon outside of America 
where there is no such access to firearms had to visit a gun store either in America or somewhere where there were, you know, gun regulations if mm-hmm. you if you go to licensed stores or or licensed shooting ranges or something and you had to purchase a gift voucher for the same amount that that you would have to spend to purchase an AR15 semi-automatic rifle in America and you had to keep that kind of framed in your house as your token of allegiance to Sean Moon That's the- and the, same, I've ever heard. and the sanctuary church so that you, you you do you know for people that want to be aligned with that group outside of of america this is one of the ways they get around that is yeah so we've probably got time for one more of these okay. fascinating stories so i would like you to tell me about snake handlers you got it okay so deep in the hills of west virginia there is a group um, that is very difficult to track down. It's a form of evangelical Christianity where essentially they take the verse in the Bible about, I don't know it verbatim, but like, if you have faith in Jesus, you'll be able to like pick up a serpent and be fine or whatever. Like it's an act of faith essentially like nothing can touch you if you've got faith in Jesus type thing. And they take it very literally and and they uh, trap rattlesnakes and which can kill you. And they then, when the spirit moves on them during their church services, um, they might speak in tongues or they might feel compelled by the spirit to pick up a snake And dance around with it. And so they're called the snake handlers or serpent handlers. Um, And it's interesting because if they are not like under the influence of the spirit, they are not interested in touching that snake. Um, When I was there, they had a snake. And before the service started, the snake took a shit in its box. Like they keep them in a special box. And so the pastor had to like get like a snake hook or whatever and move it and put it on a chair so he could clean out the box and everything. And it was clear that like he took the danger of the snake very seriously when not being moved by the spirit to touch it. Um, But yeah, they'll go into like, I don't want to say they go into a trance, but they're under the influence of the spirit, whatever that might mean. And um They might speak in tongues. They might spin around in circles like a whirling dervish. A lot of the women there were just spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. I would have fallen over. Um, And they might pick up the snake and hop around with it for a little bit. Um, They also light these fires and hold them under their chins and spin around. And they also drink strychnine. Um, So, like, watched a bunch of grown men drink poison yeah this is this is where they extract venom from the snake and then mix it with something no that would be almost more sensible because it would be related to snakes strychnine i don't know if there's a different name for it where you are but it is a very outdated form of rat poison um and It's like exceptionally potent. You should really have a mask on if you're handling the powder. Um, But they pour it into a mason jar and mix it with water and pour it into little disposable cups as if it were fucking moonshine or something. And they drink it. (laughs) And um, it's all to demonstrate their faith in God during their church services. And their music is very catchy. It's a little like bit of a Johnny Cash kind of vibe and the music goes the entire time. Um, It's been outlawed in all states except West Virginia. And that's because people keep dying from snake bites. So (laughs) it's like not a great practice. And they definitely have chips on their shoulder about how they're the most um, persecuted Christians in America because 
They're not allowed to handle their snakes anywhere else. And they are exceptionally difficult to track down. I had to really search to find some. Um, And the man who was like running the show at this church, like the preacher or whatever, he was only the preacher because his brother had died. And his brother was only the preacher because their father had died. Um, None of them have any like formal classroom training in the Bible. Like no one's been to seminary or anything respectable like that. It's just like, all right, this guy's dead. Whose turn is it now? Uh (laughs) There is a similar story somebody had told me about going to a building where, so I typically in my mind, I would, I would associate snake handling with Pentecostalism as I would with speaking in tongues. Um, Yeah. And I think that's why you get a lot of traveling evangelizers who do faith healing through snake handling. And um, they talked about all these pictures on the wall as they walked through this building. And the person that was leading them through the building said, yes, and all of these people have died. And it was just all because they were (laughs) snake handlers. And I'm I'm sure they have. Yeah. I can't remember off the top of my head which episode it was, but I remember thinking, I remember asking as well, I think, what their justification was in terms of and 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 of course there's a holy justification on why those people have died from Mm -hmm. snake bites or from handling snakes uh just thought that that was really interesting and i've looked up here what strychnine is and it says it on the the kind of wikipedia synopsis is that it's a highly toxic color colorless bitter crystalline alkaloid used yep. as a pesticide particularly for killing small vertebrates such as birds yeah yeah it's like for pest control like to kill small animals birds rats whatever oh, might be getting gosh. into your house yeah exposure to high levels of strychnine may result in respiratory failure possibly leading to death and brain death within 15 to 30 minutes following exposure that is wild Yeah, they're taking a very serious gamble. And um, the preacher who I have to say was exceptionally friendly, very accommodating, spoke to me at length after the service. Very nice, if not idiotic man um, said like he'd been brought up in snake handling, but then he wasn't religious for a long time and he was out in the world. And when he was out in the world, he was doing a lot of recreational drugs like LSD and stuff. And I'm just like, man, I think you were better off with the LSD because even if it's not legal, it's at least intended for human consumption. Like, like you can't tell me that like your improvement in life is like now I'm with Jesus and I drink poison. Like that's not a step up at all. (laughs) <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, you've taken us on a roller coaster this episode. We have spoken about uh, episode 164 with Sarah, who gave us an introduction to the 12 tribes. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Sarah. Yes, and wonderful. another quick shout out and thank you to Siren for being uh, such a kick ass journalist, uh, investigative yes. journalist, and for pairing us together. I'm so. Thank you that I've been able to have this conversation today and gain some of your stories. Other than other than cultstories.com, where are some of the other places people might be able to find or read about your experiences? Well, I also have a website. It's not not cult exclusive by any means, um, but www.lisavanarsdale.wordpress.com and I can uh, email that to you if you like, because it is a mouthful. That's where I have my blog and um, you can read about some cult stuff on there, but also just like whatever bullshit I'm up to in life, I write about um, on the About Lisa page. There are links to all of the stuff that I've written for Siren on cultstories.com. There's also a really wonderful, like if you enjoyed this, you'll enjoy. I was a guest on a podcast called Real Chills. Um, which is hosted by American comedian um, Megan Getz. And I talk about visiting the Oyatunji tribe in South Carolina on there. So if you enjoyed that, you'll, if you enjoyed this, you'll enjoy that. Um, Yeah, cultstories.com, my website. 
Um, something wonderful that Siren and I are working on is um, he's producing a podcast for me. Each episode, we talk about a different cult that I've gone to visit. It's called Lisa Joins a Cult. He named it, not me. Um, and that will hopefully be up and running and available wherever podcasts are found by the time this airs. Fantastic. Um, yes, I will put yeah. links to all of those things in the episode <laughs> description. And in terms of your live show, when can people expect to hear news about this? I have just no idea. Um, I'm waiting to like have more of a sense of resolution about like, because obviously, I mean, I've talked your ear off today. I have endless material. So it's a question of deciding like what stories are the most worth including and do they have a common through line or like there's just like so much to still figure out. And um, yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> it's really Probably exciting. Sure. So before I let you go today, mm -hmm. do you have any plans to visit any other groups in the near future? Um, yeah. So I had just done the Rod of Iron Freedom Festival and just a few days ago, I went and saw um, the spot in the Susquehanna River where Joseph Smith supposedly restored the priesthood or whatever. They've got a nice little visitor center up there. Um, but coming up, what do I want to do in the near future? This is something that I want to be an ongoing thing. I'm hoping if I can come up with the money and the logistics work out, to go to a conference for polygamist Christians in Texas in January. Um, so hoping that that works out. And then actually in a few days, I'm going to Morocco. And it is not a cult-related trip, but I noticed that on my itinerary is visiting the second largest mosque in the world. So that'll be cool to like see a serious epic house of worship. Um, so that's the most immediate, remotely relevant thing that I've got coming up and hopefully polygamists in the near future and, you know, whatever else <laughs> comes my way. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting that we've been able to have this conversation and that it is not from your position of being recruited into one of these groups, because I don't know that that would have been the outcome with every person that visited in your capacity, the way in, in the same capacity that you have visited some of these groups, especially with some of the more severe tactics coming out towards the end of your stay with the 12 tribes. So I feel lucky to have had this conversation and to kind of just stay in the loop and see what you get up to and maybe have a revisit sometime once your podcast has been released so that we can do some extra promotion for that. And just Absolutely. to kind of see yeah. what other things you've been getting up to. Totally. And if I can just like, I know we've been talking a long time, take a minute to just absolutely blow smoke up your ass and kiss it for a moment. I am just filled with admiration and respect for what you're doing here, Casey. As someone who like works in comedy and is overly aware of like how attention seeking people working in entertainment can be, it is just beyond a breath of fresh air to see someone who, yeah, you get nominated for awards and you do like have accolades and everything, but you're just so very clearly doing this to follow your own personal curiosity and raise awareness about something that's really important and to have um, meaningful moments of connection with people that you would otherwise not get to have it with. And just in listening to your podcast on long drives, it's a really beautiful thing to see that you've like created this situation where if someone brushed up against a troublesome group or is just curious about it like that girl who just like boned up on the 12 tribes you're giving them a place to talk about that to talk about what they've learned or about their experiences and that is just like fucking cool man like very 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 cool and I hope that you feel amazing about it especially considering that you like also function in the world as a partner and a mom and everything else like you're just the coolest. 
Thank so you, good Lisa. On you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Of course, people are happy to receive positive feedback about the content that they're putting out into the world. So I really do appreciate that. And I'm glad that that is the uh, effect and opinion that some people have of this platform and of this show, because I think that's a pretty accurate one in terms of my intentions. So Great. I appreciate that and I appreciate you. And thank you so much. We'll keep in touch and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Same to you, Casey. Thank you Thanks, so Lisa. much. Thanks, Lisa. Take care. <laughs> bye. All right. Bye. That is the end of this mini series on infiltrating cults. If you would like to find Lisa's writing, you can visit lisavanarnsdale.wordpress.com or follow the links in the episode description. To get in touch with me, you can find me at cultvaultpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at cultvaultpod. I'm your speaker, Casey, host of the Cult Vault Podcast.